Good morning. Please take your seats as we welcome to the podium NLN CEO, Dr. Beverly Malone. Good morning, colleagues. How can I speak without acknowledging the natural disasters of fire, water, and earthquake that have battered our beloved United States and our sister nation, Mexico? I wish I could say that the damage was in the past and we had recovered, but we are only at the beginning of a long journey of recovery. I could not be prouder of our nurses, physicians, first responders, and communities. For example, when Governor Scott asked for 1,000 nurses to combat the effects of Irma, 2,000 plus volunteered. <laughs> this is who nurses are, healing warriors dedicated to making a difference in our local and global communities. The community of colleagues extends beyond nurses. In this room today, who are we if not a community of colleagues? Look to your right, <laughs> look to your left. You will see colleagues on both sides. I would even dare say to the front of you and to the back. Here we are one faculty, a community of colleagues linked together by a shared purpose, to build a strong and diverse nursing workforce to advance the health of the nation and the global community. Colleagues linked together by the concept and reality of collaboration, communication, a dose of competence, courage, oh yes, competition, <laughs> and caring. The National League for Nursing represents the epitome of collaboration. We may not always get it exactly right, but we always dare to explore. Collaboration is here because of the partnerships and communications that filter throughout this entire room. Collaboration must be here because patient care cannot be delivered without a team, whether you realize it or not without the inter and intra professional work of nurses, doctors, social workers, pharmacists, physical therapists, administrative folk who transpose those notes, order the equipment, pay the bills, and of course the wonderful staff who fight off infection by their continual effort to keep the healthcare setting clean and safe. Collaboration is partnership extraordinaire. It reminds me of our exceptional partnerships at the NLN, Lardall, Chamberlain, Johnson and Johnson, Galen, and Walters Kluwer, only to name a few. But our partnerships extend beyond our mission-driven business to all 1,200 plus of our schools and agencies and 40,000 plus individual members. You are all, you are all our partners, and we are committed to honoring and respecting you, our colleagues. Collaboration extends to our Tri-Council colleagues. You know who they are. The American Association of Colleges of Nursing, the American Nurses Association, and the American Organization of Nurse Executives. Together, we just completed a historic journey of collaboration with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation around the APEN program, Academic Progression in Nursing, APEN. Nine states were the focus of the program, but so many others were involved. They found ways to engage curriculum colleagues to build the bridges between ADN and BSN programs and facilitate the ease of transition from one degree to the other with the goal of achieving academic progression. Working together, this so clearly represents the fourth NLN value of excellence. You know the one, co-creating and implementing transformative strategies with daring ingenuity. Our states, our colleagues, co-created and then with daring ingenuity, 
implemented. On behalf of the Tri-Council, our colleagues at AONE provided the leadership for the APEN project, since not everyone can lead at the same time. They were amazing. I've been thinking about partnerships and how it really is bridge building, communication providing the material to reinforce the strength of the bridge. Our community of colleagues identify where the bridge will unite us, identifying just the right spot for the connection. This can be accomplished through an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, or something simply written so there is a point of reference. If I mean when the relationship runs into a bump. The wonderful thing is that bridges can be retractable. They don't have to be in place forever. Colleagues, we have the option of pulling up the bridge if collaborating, collaborating gets just a little bit too overwhelming or just that we need breathing space <laughs> so that we can move back into our collaborating mode. Communication has to be evaluated at both verbal and nonverbal levels. So although most interactions these days can be Zoomed online, there is a definite need for intervals of face-to-face -face interactions to serve as ingredients for the relationship. Our important ingredients for our collaboration soup are consistency, reliability, and smiles. Are we smiling out there? Yeah. yeah. In addition, it always helps to have the organizational leader of both groups touch base face to face at some point in time. I come now to the critical component of competency, which each colleague of the community brings to the table. Nursing and nurse faculties have so many gifts to bring they must not be hidden by the silence of the gift bearer colleague at the table. It is painful for me to think of the many times I have sat in large and small auditoriums filled with colleagues bearing gifts who either have not authorized themselves to speak or they have not understood the art of speaking early in the dialogue to ensure that their comment gets placed on the table for others to absorb, reflect, and digest. The early bird must get the worm every now and then, colleagues. And what about colleagues that are aware of their gifts, but have told me they can't find the table, or have not been granted admission, or basically they have not been selected as a member to sit at the table? Well, there's a leadership coalition of nursing organizations driving a campaign to achieve 10,000 nurses on boards by 2020. It is sometimes referred to as from the bedside to the boardroom. NLN is an inaugural member of this initiative. I remember when a nice, nice physician colleague felt strongly that Bev Malone should be a member of the hospital board as he entered the boardroom, he stopped by and he said, was there anything I wanted him to cover for me? I, I mean, you know, I quickly responded, just tell him to save me a seat. I'm coming. <laughs> Colleagues, if you are within the sound of my voice, you are on your way. Please do a sound check. Have you authorized yourself to speak from the core of your competencies as an excellent nurse committed to the delivery of quality care, as an excellent faculty member committed to learning, teaching, and research, as an excellent leader committed to showing the way forward to acquire quality care and quality teaching? Me, I am a psychiatric mental health nurse par excellence. I am an educator with a research background, and I am a leader who understands leading. I'm not everything, I do admit, on a good day. But oh, what I am is quite amazing.
And I know that right now I am standing in front of a community of colleagues who are beyond excel excellence, and my leadership is in service to you. Let me move on to courage. And I borrow some of my thoughts from Dr. Arthur Swartz, founding director of Widener University's Oskins Leadership Institute. Courage requires a North Star. For physical courage, your North Star may be your country, cause, or colleague. The North Star may be justice and mercy for your ethical value-based courage. And for personal courage, it may simply be personal purpose and meaning in your life. There is no wall between these three types of courage. These are permeable boundaries where purpose and meaning flow over into justice and mercy or land in the heart of our physical courage. And it's a nice separation to consider and ponder. Courage is at the base of co-creating. It takes courage to trust a colleague to co-create with purpose. It takes even more courage to implement with a mutual North Star, perhaps visible or like the solar eclipse that you had to wear special glasses to see. The courage to find a safe place to heal, a safe place to work, and a safe place to learn and grow is a lifelong challenge. Our families, institutions, colleges, universities, hospitals, and community health care settings are supposed to be safe places. And colleagues, we are the guardians of those spaces. Co-creating safe places demands courage. And as nurses, we are up to the challenge. Finally, there is the caring for our community of colleagues. The Inland's definition of caring is promoting health, healing, and hope in response to the human condition. Healing is one of those incredible gifts that nurses bring to the table. We are healers, <laughs> and this shapes our view of healthcare systems and those we serve. In my mind, if my family generations ago had not traveled unwillingly by boat, not great accommodations, to the United States, I would be in somebody's village declaring I'm the village healer. It is who I am. I work within a community of colleagues who are healers. The community that I work with also serves and brings hope to the healing table. I don't believe we should wait until we arrive at a patient care interaction, transaction, to inquire about the availability of hope. Did anybody bring some hope with them? We should have a self-generating mechanism of hope with us at all times. This is caring. And as nurses and nurse educators, we excel at caring for others, identified as patient, student, colleague, and fellow citizen. Recently in the DC Metro, as I traveled to work, which I do on a regular basis, I made room to allow a young woman wearing a hijab to sit next to me. Absorbed in my own thoughts, my own distress about the banning of refugees and immigrants from predominantly Muslim countries, I realized I did not know what to say or do, an unusual occurrence, beyond having made room. I wanted to reach out to this young woman, and for a moment I truly felt hopeless and helpless, frozen in time and space. Then. Realizing the moment might pass me by, I said simply, how are you? The young woman smiled at me, thanked me, and told me that she had been feeling lonely. I was the first stranger to reach out to her, and she was surprised and grateful. My heart was touched. I felt useful, fully reflecting my precious roles as fellow citizen and as always caring nurse. As nurses, we are taught to listen, to reach out, to touch others, to break down walls and barriers. That is our special skill, and we must use it even when we are uncertain. At a NLN Board of Governors meeting, we held a board development discussion regarding courageous dialogue. That means begin by asking questions 
listen, and learn to understand the perspectives, the journey of others. Courageous dialogue transcends political party, race, gender, religion, and all the other differences we may have. At times, however, we face difficult challenges in caring for our community of colleagues. And I must add, for ourselves. One of the hidden seas is competition. I have met very few nurses who are willing to admit that they are competitive. Even when I say it myself, my mouth goes dry. <laughs> it is the antithesis of the warm, caring nurse who we all strive to be. But this is just not true. Competition is simply an object desired by at least two sectors, individuals and organizations at the same time. It can be healthy, natural, and stimulating. Where it gets lethal is to drag competition into the mire. That's called envy. While envy resembles competition, the difference is the willingness to go to a damaging extreme to acquire the similarly desired object. With the same authorized voice for leadership, colleagues should speak up about competition as a reality and potential available and valuable outcome. And envy should be seen and exposed as a harmful, damaging process. Damaging process. Envy, damage. Got it? Envy, damage. Competition, let's go for it. Now let's turn to the most challenging concept that I'm gonna to speak to you about right now, and it's caring for self. <laughs> There's an interesting mantra that I picked up, I don't know where, but I wanna share it with you. It goes like this, work and work, and work and work, and work and work, exhaustion. Work and work and work and work and work and work, exhaustion. Work and work and work and work and work and work, pneumonia. But then I have to keep going, unless it's walking pneumonia. <laughs> we as nurses struggle with caring for ourselves. It is slightly understandable, but we deserve so much more. And I wanna to talk to you about three types of stresses that interfere with our ability to take care of ourselves. There's inevitable stress, aging, illness, taxes, and death. Now, I have heard that some people don't pay their taxes, so maybe it's not inevitable. <laughs> there is quite a number of aging boom, baby boomers in the profession. I just recently encountered one in the mirror. <laughs> I have invested in the cosmetic industry to slow down the process, but every birthday reminds me that aging is still occurring. There's illness. You, if you live long enough, you will get sick. Your alternative is that you died first. <laughs> As nurses, we know just enough to have every type of illness cataloged in our minds. Oh, we don't need to Google it. We got the impression right there. Death is a natural part of our journey that nurses travel with the patients we serve. It's also a natural part of our personal journey. The inevitable stressor is always nearby. The second type of stressor is called imposed stress. That means that someone had the audacity to give it to you. And you had the audacity to do what? Accept it. It is clearly stress that does not belong to you. Frequently, it may be a colleague that debriefs every evening with you about trials and tribulations into the late morning hours. Don't you know that therapy is available for those types? <laughs> or perhaps your adult children who feel you look forward to taking on their issues and concerns <laughs> as official mom or dad problem solver forever. I once worked with a colleague who described her work setting as unbearable and then included that she went off to lunch with these same colleagues who proceeded to talk about everybody on the unit. 
including her. They did it alphabetically. I asked her why she would repeatedly go to lunch with these destructive coworkers. Her answer was simple. If I didn't, they really wouldn't like me. So I spent some time sharing with my colleagues that someone who spoke so negatively about you never liked you to begin with. You couldn't lose something you never had. In fact, I have an analytic test to determine if one is dealing with imposed stress. First of all, I touch the stress and decide this doesn't feel like my stress. Secondly, I smell it. <sighs> this doesn't smell like my stress. Third, I taste it. And then I know that it's definitely not Bev Malone's stress. I put it back in the box, wrap it back up, send it back, wrong address. <laughs> the third type of stress, you know, we've done inevitable, we've done imposed, and the third type of stress is chosen. It's not enough that we have all those other two. No, we go out and we choose our stress. You know, I am an authentic person. I want to choose my stress. So then we forget we made the choice. I know nurses who sometimes talk about, I was pulled out of my house, my hands were tied behind my back, and I was pushed into the school of nursing that I became a nurse. I mean, that's how they view it. And it's just, didn't, didn't you remember that you made a choice? Uh, once we can acknowledge that we have made a choice, we can then think more clearly about making other choices. I hope the C's have captured for you as much as they have for me. The C's I'm talking about community, colleagues, collaboration, communication, competition, courage, and caring. But we really cannot move forward without civility. Just the simple recognition and acknowledgement of one another as members of humanity sharing this planet together at this time. As a Southern child, it's basically minding your manners. Good morning. Please, can I help you? Thank you so very much. Colleagues, we are a community with options to value, care for, and think with appreciation about the gift we are to humanity. Look to your left. Look to your right. Tap the person in front of you and turn to smile at the person in back of you. This is the NLN. We are a community of colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bev. As always, you've expanded our thinking, brought us together, and launched us into another year at the beautiful and gracious, welcoming, courageous NLN. We now move to a wonderful part of our NLN program and summit. It is the presentation of the 2017 NLN Nursing Education Research Grants Awards, the NLN Foundation Scholarships, and the NLN Constituent League Awards. I invite Dr. Angela McNellis, Chair of the Nursing Education Research Review Committee, panel, he can't with a name, <laughs> only us academics would do that one. Anyway, she's in charge and she's going to announce the awardees. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. 
As you know, it is an NLN goal to advance the science of nursing education by providing evidence-based nursing education research and the scholarship of teaching. One of our most visible ways we meet this goal is through our research grants program, an initiative of the NLN Chamberlain University Center for the Advancement of the Science of Nursing Education. The grant awards are funded by the NLN and the NLN Foundation for Nursing Education. Over the past 15 years, the NLN Research Grants Program has funded over 100 individual research projects, distributing more than $900,000 in awards. We are indeed proud of the accomplishments of our previous awardees, and we look forward to the innovative research which the recipients today will conduct. Today, we present awards that support five outstanding research projects and three doctoral dissertation awards. But first, Please join me in thanking the members of the Nursing Education Research Review Panel, that is a mouthful, and the NLN members who served as grant proposal reviewers this year. I ask that each of the 2017 research grants PIs or their designee join me on stage as I call your name and read the title of your study. Dr. Marianne Cantrell, Principal Investigator, and co-BI Betty Mariani of Villanova University College of Nursing have received the Ruth Donnelly Corcoran Research Award. Their study is titled, A Clinical Simulation Program to Increase Graduate Nurses' Clinical Competency and Clinical Judgment in the Practice Setting. Dr. Mariani is accepting the award today. Our congratulations to both Drs. Cantrell and Mariani. Dr. Majida Albana and her colleagues, Dr. Lori Posey, Valentina Horatsanoff, and Christine Pence, and Ms. Julie Clark of George Washington University School of Nursing, and Dr. Sandra O'Brien from Catholic University have received the Dorothy Otto Award. Their study is entitled Mindset Enhanced E-Learning to Improve Medication Calculation. Dr. Albana is accepting the award on behalf of her colleagues and we are most grateful for Dr. Otto's generosity. <laughs> Dr. Diane Monsavias of the University of Texas El Paso School of Nursing and Dr. Francesa Nunez are co-PIs for the research project Developing Teaching Competencies and Clinical Nurse Educators Using Simulation, a Scoping Review Proposal. They are the recipients of the Nancy Langston Research Award. Congratulations to Dr. Monsivius, who is accepting the award today. <laughs> Dr. Yvonne Smith and her co-PI, Dr. Yija Chen of Kent State University College of Nursing, have received the NLN Sigma Theta Tau Research Award. Their study is entitled, Teaching Effectiveness in Online Nursing Education Instrument Development. Dr. Patricia Thompson, Chief Executive Officer of Sigma, is accepting the award for Drs. Smith and Chen. We are most grateful for the partnership with Sigma Theta Tau International, who joined the NLN to advance the science of nursing education. The next award is presented to Dr. Tracia Foreman and her co-PI, Dr. Ava Miller of the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley School of Nursing. They are receiving the NLN Foundation Award and are joined on stage by Dr. Cole Edmondson, Chair of the NLN Foundation for Nursing Education. Their study is entitled, An Integrative Review of Education and Faculty Development in Nursing Informatics. Congratulations to Dr. Foreman, who is representing her research team. Next, it is my pleasure to present the Doctoral Dissertation or DNP Awards for 2017. Kelly Dyer, a doctoral student at the University of West Georgia, has been awarded the NLN SNRS, Southern Nursing Research Society Dissertation Award. 
Her study is titled, Phenomenological Exploration of Male Combat Veterans in Baccalaureate Degree Nursing Programs. Kelly is joined on stage by Dr. Demetrius Porsche, Professor and Dean of the Louisiana State University Health Science Center in New Orleans and President-Elect of SNRS. Congratulations, Kelly. Ida Ozkara San is the recipient of the Marianne Rizlo Award, which is given for a dis dissertation or DMP project with a focus on simulation. Accepting the award today on behalf of Ida is Dr. Rizzolo. Ms. Sand's study explores the effect of the diverse standardized patient simulation cultural competence education strategy on nursing students' transcultural self-efficacy. Congratulations, Ida. Our final doctoral dissertation award is given this year for the first time. Through a collaborative partnership with ENRS, the Eastern Nursing Research Society, we are proud to award Katherine Steuben from Widener University the NLN ENRS Doctoral Research Award. Her study is titled Clinical Nurse Faculty Perceptions of Undergraduate Baccalaureate Nursing Student Stress in the Clinical Environment. Representing ENRS is Dr. Anne Marie Morrow, Assistant Dean and Professor, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, and an NLN Board of Governors member. We are grateful to ENRS for joining with the NLN to support this award. Congratulations, Kathy. <laughs> Congratulations to, to these outstanding NLN research grant recipients. Now it's my honor to present the NLN 2017 Foundation for Nursing Education Scholarships. Dr. Cole Edmondson, chair of the NLN Foundation, will join Drs. Bevere and Malone on stage to present the scholarship awards. Each year, the NLN Foundation offers scholarships to more experienced and ethnically diverse nurses pursuing advanced degrees in preparation for a career as a full-time academic nurse educator. Applicants are from accredited programs who have completed at least one year of their academic studies. The NLN is proud to be the largest nursing member organization providing scholarships specifically to nurse educators. This year, the outstanding scholarship recipients to be recognized are Grace Kolodicek. She's completing her PhD at Washington State University. Tamar Rodney is in the doctoral program at Johns Hopkins University. And our last recipient today is Sylvia Waruyu. Sylvia is in the final stages of her PhD at the University of Texas at Tyler. Congratulations again to our scholarship recipients. We are confident that their work will have a significant impact on nursing education. And we are most grateful to all those members who donate to the NLN Foundation. Our goal is to increase the number of awards next year and beyond. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson, for your leadership on behalf of the Foundation and NLN. Thank you. And there are two more exciting awards, the annual awards for the NLN Constituent Leagues. The Outstanding Innovation of a Constituent League Award recognizes a league that has successfully implemented one or more innovations to support the NLN's mission and goals. 
Receiving the award this year is the Wisconsin League for Nursing. In addition to offering excellent programming opportunities to their members, the Wisconsin League has disseminated over $41,000 in scholarships to members pursuing advanced degrees. Through numerous grant-funded initiatives, the League has promoted advanced nursing studies for graduate students with an emphasis on gerontology and rural areas, supported aspiring high school students accepted into nursing programs, and provided seed grants to students planning to pursue advanced degrees with a focus on nursing education. Accepting the award on behalf of Suzanne Williamson, president of the Wisconsin League for Nursing, is Vicki Holbeck, director of communications and marketing for the league. She is joined by the Wisconsin League members. And finally, we present the Constituent League Excellence in Leadership Award. This award recognizes an individual volunteer who has demonstrated excellence in leadership, service, and commitment to the mission of a Constituent League. Receiving the award this year is Donna Murray, president of the New Jersey League for Nursing. The hallmarks of Donna's presidency are communication and connection with members. Donna led efforts to rebrand and re-energize the New Jersey League, which recently celebrated its 100th year anniversary. Donna is a role model for League members, and her commitment to volunteerism is contagious. Congratulations, Donna. Thank you again, Angela. Please join me in one more round of applause for all of our recipients. And thank you again, Bev, for your inspiring words. I know that you have a busy day with concurrent sessions, and there's more this afternoon. Following this session is the Dean's Directors and Chairs Plated Invitational Luncheon. Remember, that's the one you don't pick up a box at. And any of those attending the summit sort of received an invitation. But if we missed you, come anyway. It's Marina Ballroom D at 1230. The exhibits are open during lunch. Please support our exhibitors as you explore their resources and discuss options for active learning and advanced degrees. Tomorrow is just as busy. We will meet right after breakfast tomorrow for the Deborah Spunt Lecture. It's always a highlight of the summit. In fact, it's one of my favorite things. We move the national faculty meeting. Always an opportunity for us to discuss issues. And this is an, an opportunity for you to interact with the NLN leadership, so you don't want to miss that discussion either. And then please stay for the NLN business meeting and after lunch, more concurrent sessions, followed by the NLN Honors Convocation and Gala Reception, and it's a good one. These are busy days, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you first thing tomorrow morning. Take care. <laughs>